The following presentation was recorded at the Aquaponics Association Conference in Tucson, Arizona on September 22, 2013. For more information or to join the Aquaponics Association, please visit their website at www.aquaponicsassociation.org. Yeah. Uh, sucking the, the warm air out of your greenhouse. It's, uh oh, now we've really lost it. It's a, a really uh, common question that I get with that. And I've actually found by just pulling the air out of the greenhouse, even though it's extremely humid in there, during the first hour of a burn, you just see this water vapor cloud coming out of the exhaust of the chimney. And it, um, it actually helps to dehumidify the building. So I'm taking all that, if you want to call it stale air that's inside the greenhouse that's you know, very saturated with water. I'm extracting that out and through all the leaks in the panels and the doors and everything, I'm bringing in fresh cold air into the building. Um, but it's nice fresh air and I've noticed that things like the powdery mildew isn't as prevalent anymore. I still get it because it's, it's still humid in there and I'm heating the water a little bit. But it, it helps to exchange the air out and, and keep fresh air in the building. So, um, yeah, I've gotten asked that a lot on, you know, bringing the fresh air right directly into that burn tunnel to make it run more efficient. And I, I can't justify doing that since I'm getting a, a good trade off with um, some fresh air for the plants, too. I've also had people say, oh, you're emitting CO2. Why don't you just vent that thing into the building? It's like, yeah, if you want to kill anybody that walks into it, they're like, well, it's CO2. I was like, yeah, but CO2 is deadly. At, I don't know how many parts. You have a question? No, we have that. Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, it's you know it's deadly at so many parts per million. Even though it you know people say it's not, you, you still it can kill you. So I don't vent uh, directly into the building either. Uh, oh, so here's the uh, diagram of the I call it the rocket mass heater on steroids. If you ever uh, saw that video where this was the uh, typical rocket mass heater here, and then this is the, uh, the cover that I, I put over it. So here's the pellet feeder and a little diagram of how the pellets come across on this grate. They basically burn through, and then into the ash uh, that's created. As the pellets are sliding over that grate, they self-clean because you have that movement where the pe new pellets are coming in, they actually break up any of the, um, we call them clinkers, any of the, the chunks that really haven't burned, it sort of pushes them through this grate and then they fall down into this ash pan. And the nice thing about that is if any of those pellets haven't been consumed completely yet, they still keep smoldering away in here and they actually will keep smoking and you get fresh air coming down in through this way and it's also being drawn in this way. So anything that is slowly burning away in here, you, you get in that smoke that typically would go up a chimney or something, it gets reignited and burned you know, a second time in here. So I've had a lot of people say, well, you're, you should keep that heat source right in here, not have any of the ash or the clinkers go down in here because they're still um, help this fire. Well, they are, they just move somewhere else. And as this is burning, I can actually, not with my hand, but reach down in here with a, a, a rod pull out the ash pan and then you know dispose of the ashes and put it back in without ever having to shut down the system. A typical rocket mass heater, they have little ash pockets in them and people have to clean out the ash from the system every once in a while. You have to shut down the whole system, let it cool down because you can't get into it um, while it's still hot. And so that's been a, a very effective way of, of doing that. So again, uh, just to recap how some of the heat goes in here. We have the barrel here and then I have my Acura Legend radiator sitting on top of here. eBay's great. You can get all kinds of great things. And then a second one here. So as this fan over the barrel is blowing and pulling down that hot air underneath the floor, the fresh air from the building is coming through in here. And this isn't exhaust air. This is just standard um, air that's coming through the building. So that's coming around the barrel. I'm getting some heat going into this radiator then that hot air that's come around the barrel is coming down through here and I'm then drawing all that hot air through this one other radiator and that helps to cool off the air some more and extract more of course going into the fish tank. The air then comes down into the barrel and then it um, gets piped underneath the floor and, and comes up in different areas of, of the building. 
And oh, there we go. Oh, there, I just explained it all over again without the arrows. Um, one other thing I added just because I wanted to extract every little uh, heat out of there. Off of the, um, the gas exhaust a chimney in here, I wrapped it, made like a coaxial uh, pipe out of that. And just for fun, any of that heat that's in there, I put another little blower fan on there, blow in some air from the building around that pipe just to extract a few more degrees out of the system. It works okay. I, you know, it's more of a waste of electricity than anything else. Yes? I may have missed the service, but the radiator, are you relying on the heat from the, the mass heater and the coolness of when it cools down running through or under your fish tanks to circulate? The it's tied, the water um, that's going through this is just tied into the pump for the rest of the circulation system for the aquaponics. Yeah, so it is getting pumped, but I'm just taking a small fraction out of that, so it's not like I'm using any elec extra electricity for it. So here's a couple of uh, temperature readings. Um, you know, being an engineer, you gotta have the numbers to sort of support uh, what you're doing. And the air temperature up above this radiator is about 226 degrees. You know, it fluctuates depending on you know the day of the week that I'm burning, and um, the water coming into the radiator and then back out. It was um, when I did this test, we were at roughly 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for the water, and here it was coming out um, at 84 degrees, and the air temperature then down above this radiator was 189 degrees. So. I am losing some heat just through the, the shroud that's over that, which is perfectly fine. I wanted to heat the air anyway. Once it passes through that radiator, we lose 100 degrees of temperature just going through that. That's how much, you know, radiators are awesome. You know, you have them in your car. They're, they're designed to move heat, exchange heat. So it's, it's a heat exchanger. That's all it is. So all that hot air, it has to go through that radiator and we're just pumping you know, 60 degree water through that thing and it just it does a fantastic job heating the fish water. You know, the heat has no place to go, it's going to get it, uh, absorbed into that radiator. So it gets pumped underneath here. Typically in uh, Connecticut our ground temperature is 52 degrees. You know, it's funny here, you get cold water coming out of the tap here, it's like Ugh, this is hot water. We get nice cool water, 52 degrees coming out. Um, 57 is the output temperature um, or the ground temperature if I've run this thing for uh, quite a while. It doesn't seem like a lot of heat storage that's put in the ground, but if you look at you know, the 800 and something square feet that I'm filling you know, stone, there's a huge thermal mass underneath the greenhouse. And so I heat up the ground a little bit and then on some nights where we don't feel like um, running the, the heater at all, I'll just turn on the blower fan and use that to circulate the uh, air through the building and underneath the floor. So it, it helps to uh, keep the greenhouse from going into a freezing state, you know, maybe it stays at 47 degrees at night, um, but you know, it helps out if I don't feel like burning anything. And then um, here on this one, the exhaust was at about 110 degrees. Um, the air temperature in the greenhouse um, while I was burning, 54 degrees. For us, that's great. I love that temperature in there. Things keep growing. And the outside temperature was 29 degrees. So it, that's a pretty typical um, day for a winter day in uh, Connecticut. Oh, that's it. So. You now that's it in a nutshell. I'd like to thank you for watching. Um, I have a whole bunch of videos on YouTube. It's the Web for Deb channel. Uh, a lot of people uh, track me down and say, I watch all your videos. But uh, check it out. There's a whole series on a lot of the details on how I put the rocket mass heater together on uh, that channel. And um, there's also a whole bunch of videos on even setting up how we set up the greenhouse, the aquaponics system, and a few other weird videos that we throw in there. And then um, you may have seen the brochure out on one of the tables. Um, this year we developed uh, Track My Plants, where it's a site where you can uh, put in statistical information about your plants that you're growing, try to keep track of what you're doing and when you should be harvesting some stuff. So we're trying that out this year to, uh, to, um, to help people out a little bit with uh, keeping track of their crops. So do we have any uh, additional questions on the heater that you want to cover? Yes. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, basically it was a lack of space on my part. I ran that ductwork underneath the floor and I didn't have enough room between the wall and the tank. Let me go back to that. Could you not, could you not expand, could you not just take the exhaust pipe and Oops. run the ductwork around the inside of the greenhouse itself? Yeah, you could. Um, you, you do start getting that resistance to the ductwork if you have way too much of it. Um, I thought I was going to have enough just by uh, running it down through here and then out through the, the sidewall because it was about 30 feet or so in there. Um, but yeah, like I was saying earlier, there are some people I've seen, they've run some fairly long ductwork just through the entire greenhouse. Um, that's why they usually split it several times because you have that one eight inch duct, they split it four times. You've reduced that friction through the system and slowed down that flow rate uh, through there. So yeah, you can run it longer. Do you have any other questions? No others? You have some great questions, so if you have any others. Yeah, I'm in Texas, so my problem is not heating, my problem is cooling. Oh, yeah, I mean, for cooling, I don't know what your temp ground temperature is. Um, so that's not too bad. I mean, if, you, if you're doing the excavation work for a building, I would invest in you know, a few hundred dollars in stone and pipe and bury it underneath the floor a few feet and then just run a blower fan through there. Climate battery? It's a climate battery. Well, That's I, all it is. To reiterate, I'm in Texas. So in Texas, there's about three inches of topsoil and there's about two feet of caliche. Yeah. Well, we, or yeah, we run into the same. You know, it looks like nice dirt in here, but over on the side, there's this huge pile of rocks, you know, half the size of this room that the excavator had to pluck out. So yeah. it does get very expensive to do the excavation work. And that's, it's one of the common questions I get even for my greenhouse. They're like, oh, you should have put in a, theo, a, geo, a geothermal well. I was like, you haven't been to New England because it's all granite here. And our well at our house, it's 800 feet deep. It costs around $12,000 to put in the one well. And we get a quarter gallon a minute of water out of it. We barely meet the health code. That's why we had to go so deep. So you, you know, you're starting to pump, you know, let's say, hot water uh, through that system. With the geothermal wells, you need you know, movement of water under the ground to get that hot water out of the well, move it someplace else in the ground and get the, the fresh water into there. So there is, it's an economics uh, thing if, on how you want to do it. Uh, if you, you yeah, if you slow down the rate of the burns, you really start losing the efficiency of the burn. It's, then it's just a regular stove because you've lowered that temperature down and you can't burn off some of those secondary gases that really have to burn off at a higher temperature. Uh, even like this, it's an 8-inch pipe. My stainless steel one that I put in, it's a 6-inch pipe, and I've noticed a difference just with those burns because I, I can't draft it quite as quickly. Um, so a lot of that you have to rely on the drafting and some people they play with little four inch ones and they, they just don't burn uh, quite as well. So th there's a trade off on how, on how you want to do that. And you know, with wood, people have said, oh, just split your wood so that it's really nice and long and make a nice long chamber for it. You know, every, I've never seen a perfectly straight log, especially up our way. They have knots and everything and it starts feeding through, it gets hung up on the chamber and it, it's really hard to to feed, you know, logs and, you know, anything. I don't care how good the draft is, you're going to get smoke. You'll get smoke coming back out. Right to the fire, you're going to get Yeah, it'll, it'll start back feeding. And you have to be careful, um, like, which side of the building or um, how you're venting it out. Because if you have really strong winds and you don't have your uh, vent work right, you can actually get a quick backdraft through the system. And it's actually, since it's a gasifying system, you blow your gas back out and it can night in the building. I've had a couple just slight backdrafts in it. So there's a word of warning. Usually I've run this thing um, when it's really windy out and once it's cranking, it's never backdraft. It just, it has so much force. You know, it, it just sort of boggles the mind how much force it has just from that heat going up that chimney like that. You're just sucking the air from the room? Just sucking the air from the room. 
Well, that's, it's funny because underneath the door, I took the weather stripping out from it when I actually installed the door because it didn't quite fit right. And so you put your hand underneath that. When that thing's running, you just feel the air blowing in. And then when it's really cold out, the whole bottom of the door has an ice thing on it. And you have to actually kick the door open to break the ice off of it. So yeah, I mean, you have these cold areas that the condensation just starts accumulating. Yes. Yeah, like a lot of the the propane gas insert uh, fireplace that people install their, in their houses. There, it's a coaxial pipe, so you have that cold air coming in. It's gaining heat as it's uh, going over that pipe over the exhaust. That burns and then goes out. So those are very efficient ways of doing it. Uh, but um, I was saying that I like to just burn the air that's in the greenhouse and, and burn that out. And it, it's funny when you're watching these burn, um, I think it's on the first picture, the original one, if I can get to it. Um, during about the first hour of the burn, you see a lot of condensate coming out of the system because that's when it's burning out all that moisture that's in the, uh, the greenhouse. And then after that, I've actually gone outside because I thought the heater wasn't running at all because you don't see anything coming out of the chimney. There's no condensate left because you're not burning out any of that humid air. Oh, we gotta go way back here. And um, so it actually looks like there's nothing burning. You can see here, I came out one morning, the sun was just coming up. I fired it up, walked up the hill and took a picture. So this is you know, the condensate that we normally get. But after an hour or so, you see nothing. And, and it's funny because you can go up, take a ladder up there, put your face right over that thing. You, you feel a little bit of warm, sort of damp air coming out. Take a sniff. You almost smell nothing. Just a very, very light hint of wood burning. I mean, it's just, there's just nothing coming out of these things. That's all right. I like it. The, uh, I'd be interested in some more of the detail on the automatic feeder that you were talking about. Yep. Yeah, I, I keep a, uh, first I keep a board over the hopper so that if it does, you know, backdraft in there, there's no air that can get into it. Um, but essentially it's feeding in, you have to look at it almost like one of those cat feeders that people have where they put a, a jar of cat food on it and then it comes out into a dish and the cats eat it from one side. So as they eat it, it removes material out of the way and then more can come out into it. So the part that's burning is on one end and then the newer stuff that's coming out of the hopper is on the other end and it never, it never back drafts or so burns back. Really working if, it's, if it's the pelletized brown stuff or the shake and deal with that. Yeah. You said you were looking at the wood chips. It's, <laughs> it's difficult. That's one of the things I'm developing now is because the nice thing about the pellets is they're round and they roll so it's almost like a fluid going into it. With the wood chips, we're really at random sizes on these things and they all get caught up on everything. Um, so one of the last videos that I did, in fact I published it last week, where I'm showing how I'm processing the wood chips to try to get them more to a standard size so you don't have a six inch long stick and a little uh, tiny piece. And um, last weekend I did a, a, my first good successful burn, just burning the wood chips in there. So I didn't quite have it ready for the presentation, but um, hopefully this year it'll be ready to do the wood chips. When, when we did a tour of the elementary school, they were feeding their fish with an automated fish feeder. Yes. And it was for pellets that looked a lot like yeah. wood pellets. Have you thought about just having that at the top of the chute? Yeah. Electrically every 15 yeah, seconds. Yeah, and that's... <laughs> It's difficult um, with that, like with a regular wood stove that has the, the augers built into it, they have the, um, the electronics built into it to monitor the heat that it's generating and the flame because if you just set up an auger to run at a consistent rate, you're going to have to tweak it a lot to make sure that it's feeding the pellets in just at the right speed so that you aren't burning too slow or you put too many pellets in and then you start choking the fire because you have too much unburned material in that burn chamber and choke it out. So it's, I decided just to do it by gravity and sort of let it, let it feed itself. Um, even with the wood chips, I haven't quite figured out if I should put an auger in and, and try to... Yeah, I probably could. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, like I said, I'm, I'm frugal and like to experiment with stuff. So, you know, it's one of those things, if you could get this to work completely, you know, essentially off grid, I know the pellet stoves, they don't use a lot of power. Most of them have blower fans in them and stuff. You know, I'm, I'm trying to avoid um, any of the, you know, wasting electricity on it. It's just, it's, that's just my thing with it. But you're right, you could definitely uh, put some more automation into it to, uh, to really control it. Yes, sir. It's a perforated black, it's a corrugated pipe that has perforations in it. Okay, so the air is actually then going out into the ground. It does a little bit. You know, somewhat, you know, I'm, I'm hoping for some air exchange in there, but it's, it stays in the pipe, but it also would radiate some out into the gravel also. Permeates up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's all types of different options. Yeah, there's definitely different options that you could do with that. So. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. I think.